Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's Health Scrutiny Committee meeting. Um, we, it's, it's lovely to see everybody, but I would warn people that we may have to change the order of the agenda today, because obviously, as I'm sure you'll be very understanding, there's lots of things going on in health, and we want to make sure that everybody can fit in and go have the best possible opportunity of talking to you, but it may not be in the same order as the agenda which you may have seen online. So, uh, going down the list here, um, it's a safety information, but as all these are Zoom meetings, I won't attempt to point out to you the nearest fire escape because I don't know where they are in your houses, but I hope you can find them anyway. Do we have any apologies for absence? Um, um, just one apology, Councillor Clough. Thank you. Good. And are there any declarations of interest? No? Okay. So we have, we'll just start through quickly and do the minutes of the previous meeting. Has everybody had a look at those? And any alterations to them? No? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, in that case, uh, I would just like to point out one item under chair's business, which is um, we are waiting for a response from the CCG on the working party we had, uh, the report we sent through earlier. So, but we will try and pick that up later, I think, in view of what of the way we're changing the agenda. So, we have no public forum. So I think we will go straight to ask Christina Gray for an update on COVID-19 and what's happening at the moment. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, Chair. So this is um, a regular uh, verbal update uh, to you all. Um, I'll start with an overall uh, update on the situation um, point you to the bi-weekly report that we publish so you can stay up to date with, with the bi-weekly report which is published on a Tuesday um, and a Thursday. So overall the background rate of infection is reducing um, as of today we have a rate of just over 100 per 100,000 um, which is uh, vastly reduced on, on where we were a few weeks ago. And we are seeing that uh, reflected in hospital admissions and hospital stays. Um, so the hospitalizations are also stabilizing slowly and slowly reducing, which is um, excellent news. Fair to say that I think um, the whole system remains challenged. It's been a long, long haul and um, I don't think anybody in health and social care or public services had much of a break uh, for, for many months. So although things are easing um, in the health system, uh, it's still quite challenging for, for everybody. Um, we have just completed two weeks of surge testing. Um, this was in relation to um, some variants of concern some, uh, that, that were identified in our area. Now, these uh, variants were picked up through routine sampling. Public Health England uh, samples 5% of all the positive cases routinely um, all the time, and they're looking for uh, changes. And they found a number of cases with a particular uh, genetic formulation which was considered to be of some interest and concern. Um, two things have happened around that, uh, th those cases. Uh, firstly, to say those cases are historic. So they were, these initial cases were picked up between December and uh, mid-January. So test and trace and the public health interventions had all happened. This is a historic uh, public health um, and scientific intervention. Um, so uh, there has been a piece of investigatory work around those cases uh, that has involved what's called enhanced contact tracing and additional testing. Um, and it's been identified that the cases we have locally are part of a, a small cluster of cases nationally, around 30 cases nationally, and um, a number in, in the Southwest and a proportion uh, with us. 
the surge testing that was recommended uh, by NERVTAG, which is the group which has oversight of um, new variant infections, was um, an instruction that or advice that was given to us alongside other areas. Many other areas that have uh, new variants were also advised to stand up additional surge testing. Now, this, the purpose of the surge testing is twofold. Firstly, it is to identify any asymptomatic positive cases, isolate those and contain any onward chains of transmission. But more importantly, it's part of the, uh, our national and global endeavor to stay ahead of the science in relation to the virus. Uh, the virus is mutating and changing all of the time. Some of those changes are harmless and some are uh, changes that we need to be concerned about. And our scientists, particularly those who are working on the vaccine production, need to have sufficient information in order to ensure that the vaccine remains a good match. So the action that we took locally had, had two purposes, a local purpose, which is to identify and uh, stop local chains of infection, but also to contri contribute to this wider scientific um, endeavor. Um, we conducted over 40,000 tests in two weeks, which was a phenomenal uh, number of tests. That's across uh, selected postcodes in, in Bristol and South Gloucestershire. Um, and we learned a lot about how to do this, um, that uh, how quickly we could move in the mobile testing units, uh, the people that were able to get to the mobile testing units, um, the drop and collect uh, facility, which was very popular, and uh, our libraries, uh, who were just wonderful, stood up uh, over the weekend to open. And of course, libraries are used to doing drop and collect now. So it was, it was a very... Um, interesting partnership that they were very quickly able to come in and offer this COVID secure service. And I think people really felt comfortable that, that local libraries are, are in their communities and it was a very locally available service. And then we built on that drop and collect model to get deeper into communities. So anybody could collect and drop back cases for friends, neighbors, communities. So we had networks of people um, out um, where we could see that there were people who were housebound or communities that would be more reluctant to come forward. So um, it was a huge endeavor by everybody. The good news is that the overall positivity rate from the asymptomatic testing was relatively low. It was 1% of, of all of the asymptomatic cases uh, was positive, and that compares to for, for the rest of our testing, it was about 3%. So overall, those positivity rates are pleasingly low. And uh, what that tells us is we're not, we're not sitting on a large amount of um, infection that we didn't know about. So that's reassuring. Um, because there's uh, been so much of this surge testing, we're still waiting for the further analysis. So the further analysis has to be undertaken by uh, particular laboratories that can do genomic sequencing, and there are only a certain uh, number of those. Um, and obviously, because there's been a lot of surge testing, um, there's, there's uh, a, a, a lot of samples that, that need to be um, need, need, need to be analysed. So we haven't yet had any more information back about uh, that whether we found anything else uh, in those samples, but as soon as that becomes available, we will make it, we'll let everybody know. Um, I should just say that the Joint uh, Oversight and Scrutiny Group has asked for um, the, the surge testing to be a uh, feature at the next uh, JHOSC. So um, Sarah Blackmore and myself will be attending to, uh, to, to, to talk about that also in more detail and, and take any more questions. Um, we now this week have the roadmap for uh, reopening and the roadmap um, needs to be seen as an indicative set of milestones rather than set dates. So the phrase data, not dates is being used. Uh, now we have dates in March, we have dates in April, May and take us up to July, which provide the roadmap for reopening but there is at least four weeks between each of these milestone dates. And that is because the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer supported by uh, the government are very concerned that we look at the data before moving past the, the next milestone. 
So the first milestone is on the 8th of March, and that will be all schools uh, starting to return from the 8th of March, supported by a testing programme and a COVID secure at school programme. And uh, the next date, which will be four weeks after that, um, the data, four sets of data will be considered. Uh, one is uh, the background rate of infection and whether that uh, the opening of schools has put too much pressure on the R or what pressure it has put on the R, uh, whether there has been any uh, increase in hospitalization or pre additional pressure back on the hospitals, whether we're seeing any particular spike in deaths. And fourthly, which is the new uh, indicator, what we're seeing in terms of variants of concern. So those four uh, principles will be taken into account before we then go through the second milestone or gateway. I think this is going to be quite difficult for everybody to manage. Everybody's very keen uh, to move forward, to get opened up, um, but we do need to take this in, in a measured way and make sure that we don't go backwards. At the same time, obviously we're pushing the vaccination program out and you're going to hear um, in more detail about that uh, later. It's, it's, uh, um, what is almost certain, unless the virus um, uh, changes dramatically or something changes dramatically, is that the background rate of infection will reduce considerably over the summer as it did last year. So there does seem to be a very clear seasonal effect. So I think we can look forward to rates coming right down in the summer when the weather is better. The acid test then will be what happens as we move out of summer into autumn and winter again. And the other thing that's probably certain in all of this is that we will have, we always have winter pressures. We will have winter pressures with COVID. The question is, how much COVID pressure will there be on the system next winter? And there are obviously sort of worst and best case scenarios with that, depending on how the vaccine uh, programme goes. So it's a quick counter through. We do keep, um, we do keep um, the narrative uh, up to date on the website. So, so do uh, look at that. And, and if I'm uh, happy to take any questions now, uh, Chair, um, or if there are questions that come up uh, during the course of the session and I'm not able to be here, just do send them through and I'm happy to answer in between time. Brilliant, thank you. That, that, that's really helpful, Christina. One question from me straight away is, there was a lot of, um, comments about, about this surge testing and so on um, in the media. And it did seem to be that there were an awful lot of um, test kits that hadn't been returned at one point. Yes, we still have, uh, I, th I think it's about 10,000 still out. Um, I guess that's the downside of doing a drop and collect model that it is on trust. So first of all, people have to come and collect the kit and then they have to get it back. Now there might be somebody, some of those kits might have been spoiled. So if somebody doesn't get the test right, they might dispose of that kit and, and then go and get another one. So you'd have a certain number of voids. Um, some people will have taken a test kit and not got around to getting it back. So we will have a programme um, to, or, or some communication out to, to suggest to people what they do with those, with those kits. But um, in, in the scale of things, I think the collect and drop on the whole did work extremely well. It was very flexible. And in the end, more people dropped their kit back than went to a mobile testing unit which surprised me actually, because initially the mobile testing units were doing about a thousand, uh, they were doing huge numbers every day. Um, and um, it, it, by the end, it was, the, it was the drop and collect that was outperforming those. So yes, I think it's just um, human nature, isn't it? <laughs> and people may be keeping them for you know, other reasons, uh, but, but we'll have ways of encouraging people to drop them back uh, to the right place. Mm. And, and the other thing is that it, it does sound as if we might be moving towards a situation where you have an annual COVID jab in the same way that you have an annual flu jab. I, 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 that would be my summation, but I would ask the vaccine group, uh, vaccine yes. uh, experts who are going to be talking to you later um, to, to, for their view on that. Yes, yeah. yes. Right, um, I can see Jill's got a question. 
Thank you, Christina. In fact, it's probably more of a comment than a question. Firstly, just to say thank you so much for the clarity of all the information that you're bringing to us. And I think we really need to commend you and the team for taking the time to, to keep us councillors updated. And that helps the public remain you know, up to speed with what's going on. So a, a thank you for that. And really just to comment, as you highlighted, about the use of libraries. I think this is really important as we move forward, looking at the future of what libraries can be. It seems that they're very much providing a kind of central trusted role in the community for things like this, you know. And so it was just really to sort of highlight that, I suppose, and think, well, we must take that forward and, and learn from that. So thank you. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, just coming back on the point, uh, the, the point that Jill just said, I, I have to say, um, under uh, uh, Christine uh, stewardship and leadership, um, the public health team have done a phenomenal job. And I'm telling you, they are doing like 24 seven from the day we heard about the first case, um, you, uh, Christina stood up the team and we haven't looked back. So. Um, yeah, I want to publicly applaud um, Christina, Carol, uh, and all of the public health team for the phenomenal work that you have done in a really trying situation. So thank you. And I think the, the point that you were making about the use of libraries as well, um, I, 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 was, I was obviously concerned that because we didn't reopen all of the libraries, across the city, that there was a bit of pushback from people during the time when we were in and out of lockdown. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we see the libraries as developing uh, as community hubs. In fact, we use some, uh, a couple of the libraries as part uh, of the, um, the community shielding efforts and uh, to, to get, kind of get stuff out because we do recognize in certain communities, the library is the only kind of lifeline. So I think in terms of going forward, we have the library strategy that came out last, um, towards the end of last year or in the summer of last year. So we, we've got the library strategy. We've just secured, um, uh, uh, I can't tell you how much it is yet. Because, uh, I'm not allowed to tell you, but we've actually, just secured some government funding to invest in um, a small group of our libraries that will extend entrepreneurship and business um, use of business in, in, in the library infrastructure. So yeah, in terms of its role around public health, libraries have a huge role to play. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can I ask um, if anybody else has got any questions for Christina? And just to remind everybody, when you've used your virtual hand, which is really helpful for me to see you, could you put it down? Thank you, Jill. Right. Any, any further questions? No? In that case, Christina, I think on behalf of this group, I'd like to extend from all of us a thank you for you and public health in general for everything you've been doing recently. It's been really helpful having feedback and knowing what the position is. And it's helped us to talk to our constituents as well and explain what's going on. So thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you also to you all and, and the partners that I can see here present. I mean, there's no doubt it, 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 this has been an absolutely huge team effort and uh, the roles that you all play deep in your communities and our NHS colleagues as well. So thank you. Thank you. Right, so moving on. Um, our next item on the agenda is down as item eight, the Health Scrutiny Working Group report, and I believe Michelle is here to comment on that. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So um, just bringing back a verbal um, update on the discussion that our governing body had back in December about the working group report. We're putting together a formal response. Um, but people might know we, we paused our governing body meeting for February. So um, I'm just pulling that together um, on behalf of governing body now but um, just verbally in the meantime I think there was a, and Lisa's here as well who presented the report to governing body um, in December there was a really wide-ranging and appreciative discussion actually um, of the working group report and the themes within it um, and it's all captured in our minutes from the meeting in December as well. Um, Lisa kind of started off by outlining to full governing body some of the stuff around the process so the scrutiny sessions that had informed the report 
um, and the usefulness actually in bringing that range of partners together to discuss um, some of the pressures um, that the system was facing and then the implications obviously for routine services, um, staffing and also mental health services as well. Um, I think governing body welcomed the joint working and actually there were three core themes of reflection in the discussion, I think, which we'll be bringing out fully in our formal written response. So just to give you a sense of those, um, digital exclusion and digital literacy was something that we um, drew out and discussed in that session. And actually the insight within the report about that manifesting itself in different ways and that needing to be core to how we communicate and go forward in terms of recovery. Um, we also discussed alongside planned care screening services and actually the importance of ensuring um, a clear message on the re-establishment and safety of screening um, as well as um, elective care um, and also the importance of continuing to communicate effectively with patients on waiting lists which is obviously um, a key theme within the working group report so obviously we know people will be waiting longer for their routine care um, and we need to work together as a whole system um, on this as we restore services in the months ahead. And I think Lisa made the point that we're continually learning on that and continually kind of developing um, our processes for that as a system. So that's a bit of a flavor of the discussion and a big thank you, I think, um, to the working group for pulling that together uh, from, from governing body. And we'll be drawing more out for you in the formal written response um, from governing body members to HOSC and how we're taking that forward into our recovery plans. Lisa, I don't know if you've got anything more that I've missed or you'd like to add from that. Sorry, in, in, the, in the attempt to take myself off mute, I've managed to turn my video off, um, which is better than I do on MS Teams where I tend to leave. So, um, but just in terms of, just to thank you for the report, it was really helpful. And I think it was also really helpful. Um, I think when we presented to you, you also got a flavor from both Mark and Evelyn in terms of the position from both UHBW and from um, MBT. But I think the big bit for us is actually picking up that learning and making sure that we embed it in our recovery as we start to think about how we start to turn services back on because obviously as you'll have recognized as we've gone through um, the most recent wave of COVID infections a number of services have, have had to um, stop and how we start to bring them back online and you know and I think the one around digital literacy is so important in all of the things that we do and you know and, and I know you'll probably raise this as we have the conversation around mass facts later on today exactly that issue coming back through so I think it's one of the key key points whilst we say it's really easy we have to make sure it's accessible for our population and if it's not think about how what the other options are for us great thank you it's it's good it's good to see that some um, what we produced made sense to you anyway and it was it was great the participation we got from so many people in there so yeah um right i know asha has got a hand up anybody else well we'll take you first asha then See if got any uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that feedback. I just wanted to um, just uh, follow on from what you were saying around um, digital inclusion. And as you said, more and more, it, 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 it's becoming, you know, much higher priority for all of our um, organisations. So um, we've now stood up in the last three weeks, uh, a One City Digital Inclusion Group instigated really by the feedback from this group and also um, from the business community in response to the needs of young people's access to um, access to uh, the internet and to um, equipment but we are broadening the scope uh, because the need is far greater you know um, than, than just uh, children and young people it's also older people it's also certain communities uh, refugee migrant communities so we've got like nearly five four thousand laptops that we are busily <laughs> turning around um, but um, it's more than just giving out the laptop so we've um, we've identified a group of 50 50 older people that are going to receive uh, these uh, mm -hmm. these laptops uh, but we're also adding training so they'll also be able to be taught how to use the equipment they've given. They'll all be Wi-Fi enabled. But I, I'm talking this way because we know that we need more health apps. You know, there's a lot of promotion around more apps around mental health and that, that, those uses. So, um, yeah, we need to kind of like tie everything together. So in terms of any digital inclusion strategy that uh, the, the NHS, uh, the NSSB are working on, CCG are working on, then that needs to tie into Bristol's uh, kind of um, direction of travel and make sure we're, 
not only sighted but working together on, on this so yeah thanks for that Great, thank you, Councillor Craig. And obviously we will make sure, because one of the other bits that we're also really conscious of is some people don't have the broadband, you know, in order to have the Wi-Fi or well, the, the data great. on the data packages. And it's and it's trying to make sure we've got it from every single bit of the perspective, isn't it? So that's why you need to be at the table because we, we've negotiated a really great deal with with uh, uh, some, some big kind of providers. So- Brilliant. Uh, and I think we could look at how that could expand. Brilliant, that, that's great, thank you. Okay, any comments from anybody else? Any questions? Okay, Dan, are we okay to go on to item nine? It's the, um, the mental health update. You're on mute. <laughs> Apologies. Yes, we, we have we we have the appropriate um, people here. We have Mark Harris, the bunker from the AWP, um, and Emma Moody, who's Great. just taken her camera off. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm I'm checking with you each time because I know people are possibly going to be not quite. Yeah, it's just to that. update you because I know uh, Councillor Craig um, was asking about it. Um, I've asked Lewis Peake if um, we could bring the drug and alcohol item earlier and um, it does involve three other officers um so he's just liaising with them to see if they can make it as well that's that's fine right okay well we keep going we keep going with where we are in the short term see how it goes right so item nine specialist children's mental health in patient beds in bristol an update because we had some questions about that previously so I'll, um, I'll jump in here if that's all uh, right. Apologies, it was Anna Norris that was leading on that. <laughs> Emma's on yeah. hand for uh, any questions as well, though, I should say. Um, so, hi, I'm Anna Norris. I work for uh, Bristol, North Somerset, South Gloucester, CCG. Um, just to kind of working in the commissioning directorate. So, um, I'm here to provide an update on the provision of specialist mental health inpatient beds um, alongside... Mark um, from AWP, who's the provider of the services. So specialist children's mental health inpatient beds are, um, they are commissioned by NHS England, but as a CCG, we work really closely with them. Um, Riverside unit, which is our specialist inpatient beds um, in Bristol, they've been ongoing, undergoing some refurbishments. Um, so that's going to increase their capacity in the unit from 10 to 12 beds. Um, so they are due to complete in June. Unfortunately, there has been a slight delay from March um, due to the result of maintenance issues with the roof, but we are hoping that they're going to begin um, opening in June. So um, AWP have been providing additional services um, to support children and young people at this time. So that's included uh, extended crisis interventions, uh, enhanced day programs, so operating between 7.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, and that's seven days a week as well. The day program that's offered is personalised to each individual um, by developing a personalised treatment plan in line with um, NICE guidelines as well. And alongside that, they're also providing telephone support and advice 24 hours a day and home visits if that's required for the child. Um, where young people do require inpatient admis admission, and obviously where possible, we do try to avoid that. They will they try to be accommodated in the nearest adolescent unit. So for Bristol, I think that's in Bridgewater. I'll just pause for a second there and just see if Mark wants to jump. Mark wants to jump in with anything other um, than what I've said. Oh, I think you're on mute, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Um, no, there's nothing further to add to that. It's really helpful, but I'm obviously happy to take any questions as well in terms of the provision or where we're up to. I did just want to say that NHS England have provided a statement um, for today as well, which I'm happy to provide a summary of that if that's needed. OK, well, I've got Eleanor and Jill have indicated they'd like to speak, so I'll start with Eleanor. No, sorry, I wasn't indicating. I was just uh, checking I was on the oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> You're like you were waving at me. So. No, no, I've got a noisy teenager clattering about. I was just checking ah. I was muted. Right. <laughs> okay, in that case, Jill, have you okay. got any noisy teenagers or are you just 
Yeah. No, no, no. All just quiet on my end. OK, yeah. thank, thank you very much for that update. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to ask. I obviously, you know, understandable um, reasons for the delay to June. You know, it's disappointing, but, you know, these things happen and we've been in a difficult time. I just um, was hoping that we would continue to get figures of um, placements in region and out of region up until that time, just so that we get a clear picture of, you know, what the demand is. And my uh, my question was actually whether there has been any service user evaluation of the day programme and the community services that have been set up in the meantime. I think we'd be quite interested to sort of hear anything about that really, and how those services have been evaluated. Thank you. So I'm happy to provide some figures if that's okay, um, Chair. So. Um, the bed process, as Anna's described, is, is overseen and managed by NHS England and in improvement, um, but we have a key role in um, delivering of that service. Um, so we closed the inpatient bed capacity in February, sorry, in March 2020, so um, nearly a year ago. Um, the figures I have until the end of January um, were that there were 82 referrals for an inpatient bed. In, that, in this 10-month period. Um, of those, the Enhanced Day Programme was able to manage and work with 37 of those, so um, nearly half. Um, 35 of the people went to a bed in region. Now, what we class as region is the southwest. We're part of a provider collaborative that does go down to Cornwall. And Priory, um, Bristol were part of that collaborative and provide bed provision until they closed in August last year. So. Um, six of those went to Bristol beds um, with the Priory before they closed. The others went to beds within the, the Southwest region. Um, and we did then have seven that went out of region. So anything without outside of the Southwest. So um, those are the numbers. Um, anyone that goes too far away from home is clearly not great for the young person or their family. But we've done as much as we can to work with our commissioners, NHS England and our partners in the Southwest to, to manage those uh, that need. May, may I just come back briefly? I think I was just hoping that we would continue to see those figures right up until June. Is that so? It's just a request, really, that we we continue monitoring those figures um, until Riverside reopens. So thank you for that, Mark. Okay, sure. Um, Vicky. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wanted to ask really a clarification question, if possible. Um, would these be beds that are used by young people who have an e eating disorder would that be included in this cohort so i haven't included those numbers because we don't have any specialist eating disorder cams beds within region all of those go out of region um, and they're managed by nhs england and improvement so i haven't got those figures to hand but the numbers i just quoted okay. don't include the specialist provision that is not available in region anyway right. okay Thank you. So that, that includes um, psychiatric intensive care as well as specialist eating disorder. That's an interesting point. So how far away would they have to go for that? Um, I think our nearest specialist eating disorder unit is in uh, Coventry. Um, mm -hmm. So we yes, that is clearly an issue with us um, that we're working with commissioners to see how that might be delivered more close to home. So I think we didn't we didn't realise they were, they weren't included. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, that Jill, you wanted to follow up on your previous question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, it was just just to um I was just awaiting just a response about the, any evaluation of the um, day program and community services, please from from service users themselves. I wondered if that work's been done. Thank sure. you. Apologies, Jill, for not um, responding to that part of the question. Yes, the, um, the unit are taking an evaluation, which includes service users. We have a uh, service agreement with Bernardo's um, to do and work with us to support the um, young person and child um, engagement. Um, so we're planning to do a write-up of this programme because clearly if we've managed to keep more people out of needing an inpatient bed, that's good for the young person. And we want to show um, and work with them with both CCG commissioners and NHS England about what we might do differently in the future um, after we've reopened. So we will be doing an evaluation. Yes. Right. Um, Asha, I think you had your hand up or was that from previously? <laughs> that was previously. And Vicky, did you want to come back or was... Everyone keeps moving around the screen. I'm looking at somebody and then you all shuffle around and I've got to work out where you've gone again. <laughs> Sorry. 
just wanted sorry, to... no, Brendan, my, my hand was up, still up by mistake, sorry. That's all right. Yes. Fine. Okay. So any final comments on this item from anybody? I think we will be keeping an eye on it because obviously it is worrying that you know, young people and their families have to travel to such a way. So if there is any slippage, it would be useful to let us know on that one. Yeah, good. Um, right, I think if we're back to the agenda, I'm not sure where we are with this at the moment. So, Chair, we, we're waiting on um, some people for item 11, um, but we do but we do have representative from the CCG for item 10 I believe in that case let's let's go with item 10 because that's a reasonably short one at the moment I mentioned item 11 is because um I've just heard from Lewis Peak and he can be here um within five or ten minutes so that item could be for item 11 right so okay. we, can do, we can do item 10 can't we? yeah item 10 then that's the right. drug and alcohol and then item 11 okay Right, so item 10, I'm not sure who's talking on that one. On my list, which is about the carers accompanying patients for outpatient appointments. Yes, we have Andy New Newton, I believe, is in the meeting. Oh, yes. Hello, yes. Right. Hello. Thank Andy. you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, my name's Andy Newton. I'm head of plan care at the um, BNSG CCG. Um, and um, and I've come along, I understand at your last meeting you asked for some clarification on um, about carers being able to attend appointments uh, with patients. And um, so so we've we've spoken to our providers and um, and we can confirm that carers are able to attend appointments alongside patients where face to face appointments are required. Um, outpatient leaflets and letters patients prior to their appointment um, um, explain in the letter that um, ideally patients would come alone, but they do say clearly patients should come alone unless a carer is required. Um, we, <clears throat> there aren't any specific policies in the organisations about carers about what's meant by carers or whether it's volunteer or not not, not a volunteer um, and, and so there's no differentiation made between different different kind of carers um, and and I've also just had confirmation that our, our organizations aren't aware of there being any particular issues or any concerns that have been raised to them over the last few months about carers attending appointments um, and then I thought I would add that I, I um, spoke to a neighbour recently who attended an uh, eye appointment with a brother who has dementia. And I just asked about the process and she said, oh, she contacted the eye hospital before to make sure it was OK if she attended and, um, and, and was able to attend with him. And there weren't any problems. Um, so so that so so that's the, our kind of current position with it. But if you've got any other particular problems or questions around it, then I'll be really happy to answer those or, or take them away if we need any more information. Okay, thank you, that's good. And I would confirm, I've been to caution recently with my husband on a couple of occasions and had no problem at all going in, so that was good. Any comments from anybody, any questions? No? Okay. Right, well, we're, we're keeping an eye on that then, um, Andy. And if you come across any other issues, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you. So, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Right. Are we, um, where are we now? Um, okay, Chair, we do have, um, we, we, you've got, you've, you have a choice now. We do have um, Tim Wilterston, um from the from the CCG for the vaccination item, um, but also Lewis Peake has just arrived. Um, he came early to deliver the presentation on the drug and alcohol um, strategy. Um, other officers that were going to be joining him aren't here yet. So that's uh, Victoria from the CCG and um, another should officer we, from Humphrey Shall we stick Store. with the agenda where it is then in that case, just to give them a chance to get here? and do the mass vaccination update. 
if that gives them an opportunity to be here, because obviously it would be better if they were all here together. Is that okay with everybody? We do that. We'll move on to item 11. That's the mass vaccination update. And I'm not sure who's doing that one. Oh, Tim, Tim Wickleston. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, so, sorry, sorry, colleagues. I was, <clears throat> I was just looking for, I'm used to Teams meetings and not Zoom, so I was looking for the unmute button, obviously. I uh, couldn't find it. Uh, and I've just been, I can see here that uh, I'm I'm not alone. Uh, so my name is Tim Whittlestone. I'm a clinical lead for the BNSSG Healthier Together Mass Vaccination uh, Programme. Uh, but I'm joined, um, I can see uh, uh, Lisa Manson is on this call and Lisa is uh, the executive officer who uh, oversees the project. And I can see Michelle Smith, who's our communications leader. Uh, uh, lead and hopefully I can see Claire Thompson who's our uh, SRO for the project so you've got um, you've got quite a few of us here today uh, there is a slide deck I'm not sure if um, uh, if we if I need to share that slide deck uh, so or if someone can share the slide deck you've got the facility to share it if you've got the slides Tim this is now going to, you're going to really test me now, aren't you? I can tell this is going to be... Uh, it's a little green symbol at the bottom. It's all a learning curve. <laughs> We've been on it for a year now. <laughs> We're all learning. Um, yeah. Okay, if you'd bear with me, um, that would be... Two seconds. <laughs> okay, so I'm having some tri tricky, or having some difficulty with that. I think it's my Zoom app or something is not quite there. Uh, Carol is helping me out. Carol, I didn't see you there in the background. Oh, Thank you. You come to my rescue again. <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. Okay, we can see those slides now. So uh, if I just go through to slide uh, two, I think it is, Carol, overview of the project. We go perfect. Um, right, so the mass vaccination project across uh, the region and across Bristol uh, moves ahead at significant pace. Uh, you probably have heard much of these details before, but it's just useful to clarify exactly where people are being currently vaccinated. Uh, we have a mass vaccination site. In fact, we have the potentially the biggest mass vaccination site uh, in, in England at Ashton Gate Stadium. And that is accessible to the population via the National Booking Service. So these are uh, booking slots which are sent out for, from a, a central database uh, direct to individuals via the post who then call either um, a telephone number or access an email to uh, book into appointments at Ashton Gate. We have 19 primary care networks who are vaccinating across our patch and indeed um, actually doing the majority of vaccinations. Uh, if you think roughly around three quarters of vaccinations are being provided uh, by primary care networks close to people's uh, uh, place of residence vaccinating people that they know uh, and being able to reach out to the people who uh, are on their vulnerable database. We have um, uh, completed our care home vaccination uh, at phase one, first doses, and that includes vaccinating um, uh, care home residents and staff in their place of residence. We have a roving model. Uh, and uh, when we were writing these slides, we said here we were finalising the details, but I'm pleased to announce that the roving model is now up and running. And the roving model is quite complex, uh, but essentially what we've done here is we've asked people who know um, uh, communities who we deem harder to reach to come up with very, very hyper-local solutions as to how to reach those populations. So there may be people who are homeless, people who um, uh, have uh, drug and alcohol problems, people who uh, have 
who are who, who are, the, who are gypsies, uh, people who are uh, in prison, and people who have um, some protected criteria, which make them perhaps more hesitant to approach a traditional uh, vaccination offering. And these are now up and running uh, in various locations, uh, ranging from community centres through to mosques, uh, through to refugee asylums. So I'm really, really proud of that. We've got hospital hubs and hospital hubs have been delivering to our staff and our inpatients in vulnerable categories um, and they've really completed their first phase of work which is to get our frontline health and social Social care staff vaccinated. They're having a little lull at the minute and they're about to restart their activities into the second doses. And finally, uh, but not by all means least, we have a significant offer from pharmacies and we have nine sites live across BNSSG. These are high street pharmacists who are vaccinating again people who are contacted directly via the National Booking Service. Uh, so that's our complete list. Uh, I won't, uh, I won't uh, delay on that slide actually, I might just move on because it just sort of reiterates what we said. So again, uh, much of this you'll be aware of. This is a JVCI, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation Prioritisation Criteria. And of course, whenever you set a priority uh, criteria and a priority list, it's always open to criticism. So we just have to remind ourselves how this list was drawn up. And it was drawn up essentially around people who have the greatest risk of having severe COVID symptoms or of dying from COVID. Uh, so it doesn't actually look at your risk of getting COVID particularly, it looks at your outcomes. And we know that if you take everyone over the age of 50, uh, together with everyone who has is clinically extremely vulnerable or has an underlying health condition, then you will actually be addressing 99% of the preventable mortality from COVID-19. So this list is, is, is based purely on the risk of a severe outcome or death from COVID-19. And we're already through the first uh, for cohorts we're making extremely good progress through cohort number five that's people who are aged over 65 years and over and we are starting uh, part way through cohort six and I'll just dwell a little bit about cohort six if you don't mind so cohort six is individuals aged 16 to 64 who have an underlying health condition which puts them at higher risk of serious disease and mortality so um, diseases such as asthma and diabetes <clears throat> We've known from the very start of this programme that cohort six would be a very difficult cohort to, um, to quantify, and indeed it is, and it's also a very um, uh, disparate cohort. So we've sort of chunked it up into three different categories, if you like. Our cohort six now uh, is, uh, is, is separated into people who have an individualised increased risk of a severe outcome from COVID. And you may be aware that, um, I lose track of time, it could have been last week, I think, that uh, the uh, government published results of a study called the Q COVID risk study. And the Q COVID risk looks at each of us as individuals, not just based on age, but about other characteristics. That's our weight, our ethnicity, our tablets that we take etc cetera, etc cetera. and it tries to give us a risk score for severe outcome and it has found by using that risk outcome score um, uh, about 1.7 million people uh, in a, uh, nationally who have uh, a, an increased risk of a poor outcome who were not in the original shielding list. Fortunately, about half of those people have already been vaccinated, but the other half distributed around the country means we have got an additional sort of super high urgency uh, cohort uh, to get on with and we've started doing those patients already. From the very start in BNSSG we thought that learning disabilities uh, or we interpreted learning disabilities as being a cohort of patients who were in that group and we have included them from the very start in cohort six so I'm pleased to announce that um, we're not behind the curve uh, in the recent announcements regarding learning disabilities. Um, and secondly, we have um, then patients who don't have a significantly increased specific risk, but nevertheless have uh, perhaps one underlying health condition, which puts them at moderate increased risk, diabetes, um, heart disease, cancer, for example. And that's quite a large group of patients who we're fortunately, because we have really good 
GP data bases and records and coding, we were able to find those patients relatively easily and contact them directly. And thirdly, within that group, we have unpaid carers. So I just caught the tail end of a conversation then. I think, um, was it Councillor Massey was talking about unpaid carers? So uh, just to come back to the unpaid carers, we have um, we have now a, a, a very, very mature way of finding out who our unpaid carers in our region are uh, by using uh, both G GP databases, local authority records, boards and various registers and we're pretty confident that we can reach out and invite these individuals for vaccination as part of cohort six. Okay I'll move on. Uh, just to give you some sense of time, uh, we have completed uh, cohorts four and indeed five. Uh, we have a target to complete cohort uh, uh, six by, um, uh, by uh, I'd like to say mid-March, but I might have to wait for my colleagues to confirm the exact date. Uh, and our ambition is to have completed all of the first nine very high-risk cohorts by the end of April. Slide, please. Um, I won't really bore you with much of the sort of um, additional uh, uh, publicity around uh, our various delivery sites, but um, you, you will be aware that the large scale vaccination centres attract a quite a lot of attention uh, locally and nationally. And I'm pleased that, particularly pleased that the most important thing here on this slide is the word cloud in the middle, because the feedback really from users of that service has been exceptionally positive. Next slide, please. Our primary care networks, as I've said, produce, uh, give us the majority of our vaccination uh, slots. And again, feedback is hugely positive. Um, and uh, it, it, it's really a testament to the maturity of our GP services in Bristol and North Somerset and South Gloucestershire that uh, we were able to get this program up and running extremely quickly. Other parts of the country uh, took them a little bit of time to get these services organised because their uh, GP networks were not quite as mature as ours were. Uh, you can see there we've listed for you the nine operational sites in Bristol. Next slide, please. Um, just a word about the actual vaccine. So uh, again, uh, how, to, how, to make, how to make a vaccination program complicated would be to have lots of delivery sites, but also lots of vaccines. But we've managed to get our head around that. So initially vaccinations were being provided by the Pfizer. Uh, vaccine, uh, which requires uh, exceptionally super cold storage, uh, but we've now transitioned to a mixed economy, so we're vaccinating with both Pfizer and with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, and we're likely to see other vaccines coming on stream in the next few months. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a note about frontline health and uh, care staff. Um, when we started this program, I think most of us thought, well, this will be the easy bit. Uh, let's find out who our frontline health and social care staff are. Uh, but then only uh, a few weeks later to realise that, um, unbelievably, we have 1,300 employers of health and social care staff in Bristol. Uh, quite an unbelievable number. And so we, we've done a, a large piece of work to make sure we've reached out to these people um, using many, many different avenues, uh, making sure that we are comprehensive, we're not exclusive, uh, and I'm pleased to report that our, uh, our, our data shows that uh, the vast majority of these people have now been vaccinated. Next slide, please. Um, Carol will be able to talk much more about this than I am because she's really our leading ambassador for communications and engagement for our harder to reach population. So Carol, I don't know whether you want to take over these slides. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to, happy to, Tim. So in terms of reaching our communities, and this is actually from Alex Ward Booth, because we're working very closely with the CCG in terms of um, uh, how we make sure that, uh, that uh, not so much that, uh, as, uh, not so much that our communities are hard to reach, but actually we need to make sure that we're reaching them the right way, I think. So actually a lot of our work has been about gathering data and insights, and that's been about bringing together um, everything we know um, together with all the data that we have. Um, identifying where we need to focus. And that's been quite a lot about where the roving model has come from, where the, our mobilization of clinics has come from. And also making sure that we, as well as talking to people, giving people time to think about 
um, about the vaccines, any concerns that they've got, because as, as Tim mentioned, hesitancy and concerns are uh, a particularly a significant part of uh, 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 the decision to take uh, take a vaccine or not. And we do know that with our Black, Asian and um, ethnic minority communities, take up has been lower than it has been with um, the general population. So there's been a lot of work to work with them um, against uh, with social media and particularly work in partnership with communities. So a lot of the work that's been taking place on mobile communities has been with about thinking about talking to communities about what it is that would work for them, what information they want to know, and actually community leaders taking it, absolutely stepping forward and, and doing this in partnership. And actually, in, in lots of ways, they're ahead of, they're ahead of the game. So just one quick example. Um, last week, a number of faith leaders came over to Ashton Gate, together with a load of, of lunches to say thank you to the staff but also took the opportunity to talk about the vaccine. Some were vaccinated on site, were filmed doing so, put it out on all of the uh, social media um, uh, uh, and uh, Facebook and uh, uh, WhatsApp channels. So there's a lot for us about how we make sure that, that it is a partnership. It's, it's local leaders and trusted voices who are actually doing that, talking about the vaccine. Um, there's a, uh, Charlie Kenwood, who's our, 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 a local GP, but also um, does a lot of the work around analysis and intelligence, did a really fantastic piece of work looking at which groups of people are potentially uh, less likely to take up the vaccine um, for BNSSG. So what he looked at was um, who speaks a, a, a English as a second language, where our areas of deprivation are, and also uh, uh, distance from the vaccination sites. So he took those categories and then mapped that to where the geographical, uh, and represented that geographically. So that's what this picture that you see in front of you is now. And what it told us was, um, it validated what some of what we knew already, which is that areas of Western and areas of the inner city of Bristol are least likely to be able to, uh, least likely to take up the vaccine for various reasons. Um, and that's helped us very much with thinking about how we prioritize and where we focus them, um, get increasing access over and above the mass vaccination sites and, and, um, and, and primary care networks. So as I mentioned, the risk of lower uptake, uptake is, a, is a significant one. So we've got lots of work underway to make sure that vulnerable people do have access. Um, I do want to say a huge thank you to councillors that have been helping us already and to say, please do keep helping us by putting, up, putting out the messages that you are around um, vaccine uptake. There's been some fantastic work already done. And so, um, and uh, really, really keen to make sure that um, we uh, make use of all of your excellent networks as well. So hey, thank you very much for all the work you're already doing and we will continue to ask you to, um, to uh, help us promote those messages. Just to say a very quick bit more about the uh, about the mobile delivery, because as Tim mentioned, it is quite it is a bit complex. But what we've done is try to pick up the areas that we think are most uh, require um, additional support. So that's the homeless, um, people who don't speak English as a first language, uh, people from BME communities who are, who are less likely to, to, to take up the vaccine for whatever reason. Um, those living farther away from the vaccine centre. Uh, we are doing some specific work about uptaking hospitals and also, um, as Tim mentioned, some work around physical and learning disabilities and uh, drug and alcohol use and all of the other reasons why people might find it harder to access the vaccine. So there's some specific groups and task and finish groups looking at each of those areas, um, which has resulted in um, our mobile delivery um, um, a model and as Tim mentioned which I think is great news is that people have really cracked on. Um, tomorrow is uh, the, tomorrow there's going to be some vaccinations at uh, the Mercure Hotel which many of you will know is our uh, asylum and refugee hostel site so actually um, so a bunch of uh, a, G, uh, a GP called Caroline Prince is um, undertaking leading the vaccine program tomorrow which is fantastic and we also have a number of um, uh, uh, other dates for local community vaccinations taking place from the 9th of March to the 20th and 21st, and that's Southmead Mosque uh, and also Eastern Community Centre. We'll have a couple in St Paul's and also Barton Hill. So there's a range of work taking place um, uh, to uh, make sure that we can absolutely make it as accessible as possible. Uh, I will skip on. Uh, just to mention the, some of the challenges that we're having, uh, have had uh, around the whole programme. 
um, there's significant risks and, and we, this is a huge scale program. I think it's been, I have to say, I have to give huge credit to Tim and Claire and the team because effectively we've vaccinated uh, uh, well over 200,000 people in 10 weeks from starting scratch, right? Because if you'll remember, this all started on the 8th of December. So it's an extraordinary level of achievement. Um, but in within that, there are a number of risks around how we make sure that it's accessible to people as, and make it as an even uh, playing field as we can. There is a lot of lack of trust out there about the vaccine, which is a long standing and historical concerns about the NHS um, with some communities. Um, I'm sure you'll have seen some of the fake news out there that's going through doors and, and uh, misinformation. There's a massive amount of still, and people have really genuine questions also about things like fertility. So there's a massive amount of work to do to uh, work to do to counteract some of that. Um, still a lot about barriers about how people get information. Um, a lot of people have said that um, leaders and people who look like me and make it a lot easier to, uh, to um, accept the vaccine in certain cases. So we're doing a lot of work around that. Um, and uh, there's some really practical logistics around when you vaccinate in a site that's not a hospital or a GP surgery, how do you make sure that it's safe and how do you make sure that it's, um, that it's uh, that, uh, that we, we've done everything that we can to make sure that it um, uh, uh, has equivalents. Thank you, and Carol. actually, the one thing, last thing I will say is just that vaccine supply, I think it's fair to say, has been um, uh, 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 has been uh, not always predictable and that, and that has created some challenges. So shall I hand back to you, Tim? Well, I was going to just say, um, if we could, uh, if, if Claire has now joined the call, uh, Claire Thompson, it would be really, uh, I wonder if you could help to talk through this slide and perhaps talk about the next steps. Yeah, sure. Thank you, and a really big apologies, colleagues, for being um, for being late to uh, to our slot. Um, uh, but I'm delighted, uh, as all SROs or leaders would be, that the team were able to do it anyway. So I just think I'm completely surplus to requirements. Uh, but I'll just finish off. Um, I wanted to just just frame my contribution by saying I'd heard something on the radio this morning uh, uh, from uh, um, someone in London saying how uh, disappointed they were that. That we had that that nationally the approach to uh, tackling inequality uh, in vaccine uptake hadn't been hard baked into the program from the beginning, and there's certainly uh, a, 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 an argument that that didn't happen from a national perspective. But I just wanted to reflect back what I had seen of colleagues uh, from day one on this program, uh, really taking the the from a CCG perspective. Uh, already having the population health data um, across the CCG and the local authority um, that meant that we understood uh, understood this from day one and that it informs everything that we do uh, in health and uh, local authority care in Bristol. Um, so using that population health data, overlaying it with the research and the evidence, bringing on board the special, the experts like um, Adam, Adam Finn and Rajeka Lazarus who work in our community but are also they're nationally um, uh, connected and then overlaying those those insights that Carol talked about on an earlier slide from our citizens panel and from our engagement uh, work to make sure that we've got those critical areas of focus and that they were in our sites from from day one so um, so so really how we're doing uh, is is testament to taking that approach and baking that in from from day one um, uh, I mean, I, I think the fact that we've managed to get through cohorts one to four and that we are making really good progress uh, with cohort six um, and that the Southwest is uh, for one to four was the national national leader in terms of regional uh, performance um, uh, is all supported uh, by this. Um, but the but the rollout goes on and the real challenge will come uh, 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 next with the uh, with with a higher volume and um, the need for second doses um, so so we mustn't be um, uh, pushed to focus on that at the expense of uh, really uh, getting uh, to those communities who for and for the reasons that Carol has described uh, may take longer to make make a decision um, but but who still ultimately want so I think one of the things that we've said is that um, uh, for all sectors of this program any vaccine that is given is a success so there's no sense that um, uh, the hospital hubs are more important 
than Ashton Gate, than the PCNs, than the pop-up clinics. They're all necessary. They're all catering to different needs in our population and different parts of that will be bigger at different times during uh, during the programme. Um, and, and, and as the second dose, as the second doses come on, um, we'll continue. No one will be left behind. So anyone who wants a vaccine and is eligible will will get it. Um, so I don't think there's I think I think I'm just onto a question slide now um, and I'm very happy to, to, to do that chair if that's okay. Thank you that's fine. Yeah. That's great so I can I can see people now. Lovely. <laughs> that's 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 been really interesting and before I go to questions because I can see at least three already um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I think we do have a role as local councillors in spreading information about this. Um, my own practice, the Greenway one, it's part of the affinity group. Every time they put something on Facebook, I make sure I retweet it and all the rest of it. And I think that is helpful because you do see lots of people reading it. So if you keep feeding us the information, we're passing on. So that's the first one. Um, and it, there has been some concern expressed about side effects from the, the Oxford's uh, vaccine. A lot, of, a lot more people than with the Pfizer one seem to be getting side effects. And I just wondered if you had any comment on that. So, so shall I take... So I look at my good. clinical colleague yet. Yes, so, yes. Uh, so we, we've kept, um, we, we have a separate, uh, we, we call it a clinical governance group, um, and we, we we record all the side effects that we get to know about. So I, this is by no means meant to sound comprehensive, because of course a lot of side effects we will not get to know about. And we, what we can say is locally, our vigilance shows us that there's no significant difference between the two. Uh, that's not to say that, as I, as I point out, the maybe lesser side effects that simply pe people don't report to us or report to their GP, there may be some difference there. The commonest side effect is, is a local side effect. So it's a, you know, it's a pain at the injection site or a painful arm the next day. And there are um, up to, um, uh, you know, pro roughly around one in 10 people who have a, a, a low grade fever the next day um, and may require to take some paracetamol or a similar drug to, to control that. But our local reporting for, I guess you call them more moderate and severe side effects, shows no difference between the two. And in fact, shows a very, very low incidence of moderate and severe side effects. Yeah, that's interesting because actually one of our colleagues is not with us this afternoon because she's had a job and she's feeling quite unwell so yeah okay right let's move on I think Eleanor was the first one I spotted with a hand up then Paul then Jill and Vicky thanks um just a comment first I, I just love to see data being used so smartly that that kind of geographical focus on where there was risk of low uptake and, and the kind of national effort of identifying at risk groups from the data rather than from we think people with this condition might be affected because it's <laughs> respiratory you know I just oh I'd love to see it um, <laughs> but the questions these are sort of comments and questions that I've seen on social media or have, have received from members of the public so I just thought I would ask them the first question is about where we've got the PCNs rolling out the vaccinations and as they go down through the, the sort of prioritisation cohorts, are they keeping in step or is it just a case of each GP practice looks at its list, whacks through them as quickly as they can or, or would you kind of have one group waiting while they other practices catch up or or vaccinating people from other practices even yeah, shall I take that? So um, we look across, so all of the GP practices are grouped in primary care networks, uh, Chair Chair talked about affinity, and what we do is look at the cohort populations um, uh, for each of those, match the vaccine supply to that, and um, and then in week by week chunks, make sure that no one practice is, no one PCN is 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 shooting ahead of the others. And it's a, it's a version of obviously what we're trying to do nationally by going through the cohorts one by one so that you don't see um 
uh, one one area of the country uh, uh, more advantage than another. Uh, the reality is that given the way that the vaccine arrives, the fact that you need to use it within a week, um, uh, if not more quickly, you might find that one practice is done all of their cohort one week and it might take another practice a week or two to catch up but that's that's the sort of order of magnitude that we're talking about. Great um, and another question that people have been asking is about the sort of being identified as someone with an underlying condition or someone in, in this cohort six and um, people very concerned that they've been identified and they didn't think they had an underlying condition that was of concern so I just really wondered about that kind of national identification of, of risk factors. Could it be the case that someone has risk factors that are, identify them as being of higher risk of severe COVID, yeah. but that's not actually any health concerns that they need to be worried about in general life. It's specific to COVID. Would that be the right way of explaining it to them? Um, well, I think there's two. There are two uh, things here. So, so we um, use the uh, codes that are held on the GP um, records uh, to identify those those people. So, yes, I think your first statement is a is a reasonable um, a reasonable response. I think um, I think the cause celeb of the uh, editor of the Liverpool Echo, who was wrongly identified as at risk because his height was entered wrongly. You know, there mm -hmm. may be instances of that as well. But on the whole, um, I, I think we've you know we are very fortunate in this country to have a national service that allows us to nationally identify these people there may, there may be a margin for error in there but on the whole um it would you know it they, they will be being correctly classified according to the underlying conditions that are listed um under cohort six which we can let you have if you haven't got them I guess if I could come in there, I'd rather hear. I'd rather hear that people are being called forward for vaccination, yeah. not quite knowing why, than to hear the opposite that people were sitting at home wondering why they hadn't been called. Does that make sense? I think it yes, just, yes. it's because we have a very uh, overly comprehensive way of of, of 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 drilling down our databases and calling people forward. So it's we're slightly over generous in that call rather than under generous. Right. What, one last question, which is I should dis declare an interest that I'm not 50 yet. Um, mm. What will happen next after we've gone through these cohorts? Are we going to carry on going down all the way to 16 or what, what do we not know yet what the plan is? Uh, the plan Claire, Claire, take that one. Yeah, the plan is to do all all adults um, by the, the dead. The date is is not uh, more is not specific, um, but um, I think I think it has been um, circulated already in the press as the summer end of the summer, uh, um, and that's what that's what we're aiming for. We will get we will do it as quickly as we possibly can. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Paul. I think you were next. Thank you, Chair. And sorry, I hope my tech allows me to to actually ask the question. Uh, it, well, actually, it's more 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 comments, really. Um, congratulations to all involved. It, it's been a remarkable, remarkable um, effort um, vaccinating people. I personally was uh, had my first uh, Oxford Astra Zeneca vaccination, I think the Saturday before last through the excellent Bridgeview Medical uh, at the Marksbury Road Surgery. Um, and I'd just like to say that um, I represent a ward that that, um, that was blue on Carol's map. You know, it's a, it's it's an area of deprivation. So again, it was it's an area where we have to concentrate on on getting information out. And I, I just wanted to say to other councillors, etc., as well that. Um, I asked, I went along to with my partner and I asked if I could have a photograph taken of me having the vaccination. Um, it wasn't a problem as long as we were all masked up and so forth, um, which I then put on social media and had an awful lot of response from just sort of showing that um, to put my money where my mouth was really and saying, look, I'd like you all to get the jab. Here's me getting mine. And they had absolutely no problem um with me doing that in fact the gp who gave the 
the uh, the vaccination um, when he found out which ward I represented was 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 very uh, chuffed about that. Um, and I'd also um, like to just put out a bit of a shout to to Muhammad Abdi and Muhammad El Sharif at Muslims for Bristol who've done remarkable work mm-hmm. at trying to disseminate information both in English, in Somali, and in, in Sudanese, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to try and dispel the myths. I think I think they've done wonderful work. But yes. Well done all. Thank you, Paul. Um, Jill, and then... Um, Thank you. Yeah, and again, I'd just like to add my um, great thanks and and appreciation for really this this rollout working so well. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, My question was about... um, Well, one of the things I think you've done particularly well is to think of creative ways to reach communities that are distant or find it hard to access and I wanted to ask specifically whether the people in that category that you do reach for vaccination do they then formally get registered with a GP or is some of that happening outside GP registration so that was just uh, just a a point of information really I wondered how that's working. Okay I could I could try try to answer that one as best as I can Jill so um, everything Ideally, of course, everything is registered uh, as being uh, via a GP because that allows us very rapidly to capture that data and to upload it. There is a national um, observatory uh, system, it's called Foundry, uh, which is really keeping a tab on on every individual vaccination that's been carried out uh, to give us the data nationally uh, and also to ensure that uh, second doses get done in appropriate manner. Um, we do have we do have the ability to uh, vaccinate people who are unregistered, and I think it is important that we do have this ability to do that because, again, we don't want to put barriers up. We don't want to mm-hmm. say you have to be registered in order to get vaccinated. So we have provided that uh, for some small segments of the community, uh, particularly around homeless, particularly around asylum seekers. Um, and uh, also perhaps that, you know, there are some some groups and some people who, um, who don't wish uh, their uh, total health story to be known to their GP. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, without uh, think, uh, without going into specifics, but there are some people who don't share everything with their GP, and therefore they may have a risk factor uh, for which we are very happy to arrange a vaccination, which then doesn't have to be registered uh, 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 or in the sight of their GP practice. Sure, that, that's really uh, thank you. That's really helpful to know. In fact, it's just um, set me thinking that I've got a feeling that the government guidelines that came through were giving specific targets for councils to register homeless people and lots of other marginalised communities with the GPs to get and I'm just wondering that perhaps that government guidance isn't as um, realistic as as the way that you're operating I don't know if there's if you've noticed any sort of contradiction in in that have you know have you seen those guidelines at all I'm handing over to Carol, I think. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no we have. And actually, um, the, so there's been an enormous amount of work and publicity with practices to encourage people to register on the basis and lots of assurances about um, about registering, not meaning that actually, because um, people are really concerned that if they register that not just affects their health, but also that they might be followed up for immigration purposes or mm. all sorts of other things are, 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 are cause creating real concerns. So actually there's a, a huge campaign which has resulted in, I think we had something like over 90 rough sleepers um, on the streets and we've now got 21 because there's right. lots, and lots of work to really make sure that, that rough sleepers are kept safe, but also as part of that work, there's been lots of work to say, and you can register with your GP. Sure. So what Tim is doing, uh, Tim is referred to, is those people that we've got a fail safe for if, if we simply cannot. If we can't, it. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that seems an absolutely, you know, brilliant way to be working at it, I think. So thank you for that response. Thank you. Vicky, would you like to? Thank you, question? yes. Um, I think it's probably for, um, was it Tim? Tim? Sorry, I can't see you on the screen at the moment. So, um, oh, there. Sorry, it's Tim Whittleston. Um, yeah, it was actually also about registration, but that, for carers, um, you mentioned earlier that um, that you have a kind of a good database of registered carers through their GP practice or through local authority. But I, 
certainly we've had some quite a few calls actually this week um, for people that are carers, consider themselves carers, don't necessarily have a carer's allowance, but consider themselves carers. And I'm now trying to register with the GP, but I've failed to be able to do so. And I just wondered, is there a kind of a, a, a criteria for how, you know, how GPs recognise carers? Mm. And if so, how can we pass on the information? Yeah, so I just, I, I'm not going to dodge this question. I am going to just ask Claire, because I know Claire uh, and Carol, to that matter, but Claire particularly has been working on, um, on a much more sort of comprehensive uh, slide really to, to to encompass carers claire could you take that question yeah i'm happy to share what we understand at the moment so there's a very clear definition of um of unpaid carers so we've got carers in receipt of um uh, or eligible for uh, uh, carers allowance and then the GP um, uh, list which has a has criteria I think the um, the issue is that there are a number of people who I, who identify as you say as uh, as carers or caring um, who don't necessarily fit into those categories and our understanding is that nationally there will be uh, so much as there is now for health and social care that you can self uh, staff. Uh, that you can self-declare and there's a registration on the national booking service we understand that that will there will be a um, an approach nationally for that um uh coming on to the coming onto the national booking service so that that um uh, nhs website uh to to self-declare um so i think that is the that's the sensible route if you're not already if you're not already identified in any of those cohorts i see thank you Right. Any other questions from anybody? It's been, it, this has been really interesting, I think, and it's, it's certainly enlightened us on a lot of issues around this. And uh, I hope we can continue a two-way dialogue about this because we, we can do what we can to help you as well as you telling us what's happening. So thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you. you all. Thanks thank for you. having the opportunity. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, um, are we okay to go ahead with the drug and alcohol strategy now? Uh, yes, we have Louis, Louis Peak. Um, Louis Peak came in earlier. Um, also, Victoria Blizzard and the only Roberts are here. Okay, right. So, hi everyone. Um, right, so I'll share my screen. Um, as Stan said, I'm joined by Victoria and Leany. Um, Towards from the CCG, Leany is um, consultant in public health. Working with myself, um, my name is Lewis Peake. I'm a public health registrar working at the council. I think I've met quite a few before during the process of developing this strategy. Um, let me just share my screen and do do shout up if you can't see what I'm talking about. Um, so yes, it's great to be um, back with Scrutiny to talk about the development of this strategy which we've been working on for a little while now. Thankfully coming towards the, the end stretch. Um, what I thought I would do, I'm conscious that I've spoken about this just to, to scrutiny before, but I'm also aware that this is a public forum. So I'm just going to rehash bits of the story, which um, not everyone might be aware of. So this is a city-wide piece of work. I think it's important to stress. Um, we are leading on it in the council's public health team on behalf of the city, but we do have active involvement from Avon and Somerset Police, the Police and Crime Commissioner, and the CCG, all of which has kind of developed this strategy under the auspices of the Keeping Community Safe group of Kipikar Keeping Community Safe Partnership exec. As you would imagine, it's informed by a needs assessment, um, the evidence, evidence base where available and a range of engagement work, which was held towards the end of um, 2019 and throughout 2020. And then most recently, an open consultation, which was held in December and January of this year, on the first draft of the strategy, which scrutiny may recall, I brought to a closed meeting in October, I think of last year, maybe September. And colleagues will hopefully recall that the important thing about this strategy to stress is it's not just about health outcomes. Alcohol and other drugs clearly impact in our city in a range of ways. What we try to elicit through this strategy and to reinforce is that we're trying to address issues in crime and safety, in nighttime economy, in communities, in mental health, and that's why that's the importance that we place in having that broad stakeholder group to help inform the strategy. So with all of that in mind, what I thought I would do is just reintroduce the scale of the issue in Bristol, again, for the same reasons as I've just summarised um, the story so far, to get everyone up to speed and then to um, reflect on how COVID has impacted on those behaviours. I'm then going to talk about the outcomes from the consultation that we ran recently. 
and then invite any questions on the proposed final strategy, which I um, have circulated with the appendices for today's paper. Before I get into it, I just thought I would take a minute to just reflect on the nomenclature that's going to be used. Um, you'll see that wherever possible, I try to refer to it, the issue itself, as alcohol and other drugs. I will sometimes slip in that and refer to it in drugs, drugs as alcohol. Um, but I think the, the nomenclature is important. I think it's important that we as a city recognise that alcohol is itself a substance. And when we're having discussions about these issues, they all do come under a whole spectrum um, of substance misuse. And so referring the, to the issue of alcohol and other drugs, I think, is a, is a common um, bit of feedback we received. And so with every effort, that's what we've tried to make in the strategy. So in terms of data, um, this slide here just shows um, the number of admissions, admissions to hospital for alcohol related conditions between 2018 and 19. And it's comparing Bristol to similar cities that are alike ours in terms of population and other areas. So there seem to be good comparator cities. And you can see that we're pretty middling in this table. We had 10,000 plus admissions, as I said, but the red line indicates that we have a that, that rate is higher than the England average. And indeed, if we skip to the next slide, you will see that that trend is increasing. So over the past decade, we've had a steady increase in the number of emissions that we're seeing for alcohol, quite a relatively large increase in the last couple of years. The red line is Bristol, I should say, and the black line is England. And you can see that we're consistently higher than the national average in terms of emissions for alcohol. In terms of deaths due to alcohol, unfortunately we had nearly 200 deaths as a result of alcohol related conditions in 2018. And again, we're in the top third-ish of this sort of comparator table here and significantly higher than the England average. Turning to other drugs, um, estimated that there's around 5,000 users of opiates and or crack cocaine in Bristol. So it amounts to about one in 80 people. So not insignificant. And the rate is higher than other similar cities like Nottingham, Leeds, Derby. And then when that translates in terms of drug related deaths, unfortunately we averaged or are averaging around at least 30 deaths as a result of drug related activity um, between well, over recent years. And apologies, I haven't had the Bristol here, but it's just here in this sort of mini table um, quite high on the list. And again, that is also slowly creeping up and indeed has gone up quite a bit in the past five, six, seven years or so, higher than the England average. So that summarises the, the issues. There's a slide here just touching on the impact of alcohol and other drugs on children as well. Um, and some data here from the Google Voice Survey, which gets done annually um, for Bristol. I won't talk through it other than to suggest that there are some differences that might be um, coming to light amongst our children and young people. For example, those who identify as LGBT plus, um, volunteering that they, commun that they um, are more likely perhaps to consume alcohol than some of their peers. So that's kind of where we were as of sort of early 2020. And that's when the strategy process sort of began. Conscious of course, in the past year, we've had the pandemic to deal with. Um, and I thought it'd be worthwhile just touching on what the impacts that has led to in terms of drug and alcohol behaviours. Starting with alcohol, there has been national data which would suggest broadly that there's been, there was, there was deemed to be an increase in non-drinkers as a result of the pandemic, but also an increase in heavy drinkers. And of course, it's the heavy drinkers who are most likely to um, translate into, into um, health conditions. And on this graph here, you can just see that um, in, in pictorial form. So this chart is showing the percentage of adults in England who are deemed to be in a high risk drinking category. So they, they drink more than they, they should um, they, they, and they flag up as being high risk as part of this audit questionnaire, which gets frequently done in primary care. And you can see that as of sort of the pandemic, there was quite a big leap in the number of people who sort of met that definition. This is national data, it's not specific to Bristol, and obviously it's quite early stages to see what the long-term impacts will be, but I think it kind of reinforces the message that the, the availability of sort of, and of the, the trend towards home drinking may have inadvertently led to more people um, kind of falling into this category. In terms of other drugs, there's a bit more local data about that. The University of Bristol and the Bristol Drugs Project have collaborated on some research. Again, this is small numbers, so I wouldn't, I'd ask that you don't read too much into it perhaps, 
but there is some evidence to suggest that we've seen as a result of the pandemic decreased heroin use due to lack of availability but a reciprocal increase in sort of the use of alternative substances and increasing loan injecting so people injecting on their own away from um, away from their peers away from other members of the public um, and obviously the risk of that potentially leading to sort of overdose or, or um, poor outcomes or you know risky behaviors as a result of that is has potentially increases you know as, as a result of that loan injecting so that's sort of sort of the setting the scene as to terms of where we are as, as a city um, colleagues will recall that I bought a first draft of this strategy which we've been working on to a closed scrutiny meeting back in September October that was subsequently approved to go out for open consultation which was held in December and January and for six weeks it involved some promotional activities as best as we could manage during you know the, a lockdown um, it, we weren't able to go out to communities in the ways that we may have previously done had we not had limitations in place we received 150 responses, um, which I understand from the consultation team here at the council is a pretty good response rate for the pandemic, you know, in, in, in given the circumstances. And it's certainly on a par, if not exceeding similar sorts of consultations in that period. And to support this, myself and colleagues attended sort of numerous stakeholder meetings throughout 2020, um, throughout the consultation period with groups like Bristol at Night, with the, um, with the Youth Council, to try and make sure we get as broad a view as possible. We really, really try and make every effort to engage and, and to consult on this. This first slide here shows at a high level the, the, um, the outcomes from the, from the consultation. So we asked um, participants and respondents to ask to, uh, sorry, to answer whether or not they agreed um, or disagreed with the vision which the strategy presents. And then these six priority areas around which the strategy um, sort of expands, that's how it's sort of framed. And you can see here that more than 80% of people either agreed or strongly agreed with the vision and 85 plus people agreed with all of the priority areas, which I think suggested to us that we had at least captured the issue and highlighted the main problems that people um, are concerned about within the city. Supporting that, we also received nearly 500 free text comments, um, which were sorted into themes. And it's those themes which were then used to try and target areas in which to um, tweak the strategy, to, to add things, to make it um, more relevant, I suppose, or, or more encapsulating that feedback. And so some of the feedback we received included comments around the fact that services need to be culturally appropriate, by which I mean they need to be reactive to the individual needs of the communities they serve and how these may vary depending on people's backgrounds. The importance of being um, aware of adverse child experiences and how trauma can lead to um, drug and alcohol use and similarly the, the relationship between mental health and the use of alcohol and other drugs comments around drug safety testing and how that was seen to be a positive thing, being able to um, assure yourself if you do purchase some um, or source some drugs that you can have them tested to make sure that the uh, consumption of them is, is as safe as possible. And then general comments around increasing the quantity and quality of services and their accessibility to all people um, from, from all backgrounds. Scrutiny provided their own comments as part of that meeting we held back in September, October. They were similarly themed in terms of the comments that we received from, from colleagues here. Again, mental health being a, an important um, issue. And I hope that the colleagues, when they read the new version of the strategy, will see that what I've tried to do is flag the importance of mental health, not only for a preventative um, action in terms of preventing alcohol and other drug misuse, but also making sure that we have support for mental health conditions during treatment and then crucially also in recovery. That's the bit which the consultation feedback seemed to point towards as being a, a gap in that support may, may not be um, as present as in other stages of their, the journey. Um, colleagues at Scrutiny also flagged cultural competence being an issue and again there's a whole new section in, in the strategy about that. And then colleagues here also raised issues um, around equalities and making sure that services are accessible. And again, I hope that is reflected in the, in the next version. So with that in mind, the proposed round strategy has one central vision, which hasn't changed from the draft version, six priorities, which again, haven't changed, 20 commitments still. There are some changes within those that try to, to, to flag and to, to align with some of the comments we received. And then quite a bit of change to the text that supports those commitments 
that wraps around um, and expands on the, the, the narrative, I suppose, to produce this central agreed framework for actions. And I think it's really important to emphasize that this is the, the beginning of the strategy process. This document represents the framework we will use moving forward. And therefore we wanted to capture all of the important, important relevant bits to, to Bristol. But of course there will be adaptations along the way. There will be more detail added as the action plans develop. This is very much the start of a five year strategy cycle. The vision is, as it says here, I won't read it again, colleagues have, have seen it and it is in the strategy document. And as I said, it hasn't changed, but again, to reinforce the, the themes of prevention within it and the fact that we are trying to deliver a service and preventative options, which are for all, not just for um, certain sections of our society. The priorities again are unchanged, so I won't I won't talk through those. And the commit and the commitments themselves remain, as I said, broadly similar. So just as a as a as a reminder, the first priority here around supporting communities, the um, the app, the uh, commitments within it might point to examples in terms of actions related to healthy spaces, related to sort of place based approaches, community level action, the prevention and intervention. Um, uh, priority points to actions around sort of adverse child experiences aligning with the the one city agenda on ACEs and ensuring that young people and, and their parents are educated on the harm that alcohol and drugs can pose um, that the, the increasing um, evidence that suggests that any amount of alcohol is potentially harmful minimizing harm and protecting health and clearly a focus throughout the strategy cycle on preventing and reducing deaths associated with the use of alcohol and other drugs and ensuring that the whole gamut of um, health and mental health ramifications of substance misuse are, are, um, are targeted. And the, the kind of the, the, the flag here that we are remaining cognizant of future developments in terms of things like drug consumption rooms and other measures which will really, um, I think put Bristol on the, on the front foot in terms of trying to prevent some of these okay. harmful outcomes. Human recovery, um, some commitments in there, potential actions kind of pointing to, again, the mental health themes that are, that are coming out throughout, hopefully. Tackling crime and disorder, so trying to underline to the city that Avon and Somerset Police, the Police and Crime Commissioner, do generally perceive drug and alcohol misuse to be a health issue. Um, to be a social issue, but nevertheless trying to take concerted action with partners on reducing um, crime secondary to drug and alcohol misuse and also um, serious organised crime, exploitation of children, that sort of thing. And then finally, the, the last um, priority commitments that point to actions around things like alcohol free spaces potentially within the city, um, measures like trying to ensure that within um, licensed venues when they can finally kind of reopen and, and kind of re-energize that we really push the public health agenda within those having our coffee options on tap that sort of thing so that's kind of where we are at the minute we've as I said I've shared with you the final proposed final version um, the this will be going to the the final version will be going to a joint meeting of the health and well-being board and the keeping community safe group for proposed sign off um, next month I'm sure as part of that, colleagues there will be happy to receive and, and consider any comments that scrutiny may have in relation to the current version. And the, the point after that, when hopefully this is published and, and finalised, what I really would like to um, kind of push for and what I think is something we should be discussing with partners across the city is how is it we can maintain oversight of this strategy? How can we make sure that it remains on everyone's agenda? And from my perspective, one way of doing that would be to, to ensure we maintain this momentum of systems working by forming or at least kind of putting together a new sort of multi-agency strategy group to oversee the delivery of the actual action planning steps, which I think will be really important. So I will leave it there. I will stop sharing. Um, myself and colleagues are obviously here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, this has been, as I said, on, on the agenda for a little while. So yeah, very happy to speak to it further. Thank you, Lewis. That's, that's really helpful. And it is quite a lengthy document uh, to read through. So that's that's useful to have the slides. And I know there's at least three colleagues who've got their hands up at the moment. Um, just a quick 
comment from me about um, alcohol free, about uh, restaurants and licensed premises and so on serving alcohol free drinks. And I think that might be worth sending a note about that to the licensing committee because we review uh, applications and it could be one of the questions we could ask. Um, Eleanor's on it as well as me and I, I'm just thinking that's something we could raise. So uh, might, yeah. be, might be worth adding it to the list. So Thank you for that. absolutely. Right. In order of who oh, I've seen put their hands up, I had Jill, Eleanor, and then um, Paul and Asher. So, right, we'll start with you, Jill. Okay, thank you very much, Brenda, and thank you, Lewis. It was really helpful to see this. Um, I, I, I've got a, it's a fairly nuanced response, and I hope you'll bear with me if I just raise some of my praise and concerns. Um, because I think this is a really amazing comprehensive document and it's very data rich, but I am feeling at the end of it, I'm not quite sure who it's for. I do think as an overarching strategy for providers and all the different bodies that were working together, it is very comprehensive. But what I'm sensing is that it's, it's, it's quite sort of, I don't want to say jargon heavy, but I think in a way that is po possibly what I'm feeling as reading it as a kind of, maybe as a, as a service user might. And um, a couple of points, I, what I was really picking up was really, um, or what I'd like to see as a slight difference of tone and emphasis based on the responses to the consultation, because I think it's quite important. Um, some of the feedback that came back about wanting it to be more mental health driven and adverse childhood experience informed. I think that is so important that it isn't, hasn't really sort of been reflected in the vision or the six principles. So they have remained unchanged, although you have added something to the commitments. But I feel really that that um, mental health backdrop to everything and trauma is so vital that it should perhaps be reflected a bit more, be embedded in, in the vision. This may be my personal views, but I thought I, I would share them now. Um, and the other thing I, I feel is not coming forward enough perhaps is the lived experience of service users. And I think maybe I, I totally understand how difficult consultation has been in the pandemic and it's very difficult to reach a lot of groups. But what I've sensed from reading through is there is a lack of input from some of the most marginalized communities where the needs, where the drug and alcohol problems are the greatest. And some of those groups would be prisoners and ex-offenders, people in the care system, the LGBT community, um, which I think was picked up in the consultation as perhaps not being fully um, represented, um, sex workers, people with hidden disabilities, um, so I think while I know that the overarching strategy does address all the inequalities and all those groups, I feel that it's not coming forward enough in the kind of headline of the, of the strategy. And I would really like to see a lot more um, reflection of mental health and, and, the, and that lived experience of, of the service users that this is designed to support. Um, and just, I'm sorry for taking so long, but just that one other thing I'd like to say is that I would like to see a bit more detail about how outcomes would be measured. And I think it says in the uh, report that that is going to be worked on, that you are working on a local outcome um, framework. But I would have thought that that needs to be strengthened right at the beginning so we know how we're measuring things as well as just qualitatively making improvements and you know um, so so that concerned me just a little bit um, as to how outcomes would be measured and not just in terms of engagement with some of the programs but also long-term um, benefits you know the long longer term outcomes for service users so I'm sorry that was so lengthy but I just wanted to give a detailed response because I did read it through very thoroughly and I had heard the initial presentation so I just wanted to, to share some of those reflections with you so thank you for bearing with my very long um, comment <laughs> okay yeah thank you um, if I can take some of those points in turn and, and Lini and, and Victoria Mount to contribute I think the first comment you made in terms of being, you know, who is it, who is it for? Is it readable enough? Is it clear enough? I think that was something that we were very kind of conscious of. And we, we were trying to 
and it may well come through in your reading of it that we're trying to tailor the the needs of it to the providers to the commissioners mm-hmm. to, the, to the you know to the system whilst at the same time trying to make it accessible so that people can, can take the community with us that is why we put within the strategy document a, 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 within the consultation sorry a question about whether or not people found this clear and legible and as, as readable as a document Broadly speaking, I think people agreed with that sentiment that it was clear and legible. And I think, I don't know off the top of my head, I can't remember what was said in the report, but I didn't remember taking anything from it to suggest that it was massively too detailed or too, or too jargony. Having said that, there were a few free text comments that suggested that it was. And so I think in naturally with consultations, you get conflicting responses that people give. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do take your point that perhaps the, the audience of it is not... Um, the fourth right enough um, and maybe there is something we can do about that um, in terms of the mental health bit of it and making it more mental health driven there is increasing as I, there's this, this version just have increased references to mental health without throughout it I have tried to pull out the fact that the importance of mental health kind of relevance as I said both before people even develop um, substance misuse issues but also as part of the kind of the treatment and then also as part of the part of the, um, the recovery period um, in terms of having it kind of highlighted within the kind of the key priorities or within the within the vision, um, I, I, I don't see the, there'd be a problem in, in making that change. Um, I don't know. I mean, Victoria can speak to perhaps the the broader ways in which the system is trying to address these issues. Um, and Lena, I don't know if you had any comments to make about that specific bit. But if I can just before we move on to, to colleagues to input and in terms of the lived experience bit of it. I think you're quite right that we've had difficulty in trying to get as much input from those experiences as we could. Um, We had a a task group who oversaw the development of this strategy, which did include people with experience on on that sort of steering group, I suppose. Um, And on top of that, the next next step, that sort of that that action setting board I, I referenced, would certainly have lived people with experience on that group guiding the actions that result from these kind of um, themes that we're trying to put across in this strategy. Um, I'm going to leave it there and invite Lini and, and, and Victoria to add anything else that they wanted to say in, in response to that. Um. Okay, I'll pick up first of all, um, just in terms of, like you said, in terms of the marginalised groups. Um, I think it's really worth bearing in mind, this is quite um, a high level strategy where we're just sort of setting out the vision, we're setting out, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Um, We are hoping to really set up this board and there'll be more specific pieces of work and we will be making sure that we're really engaged with the the protected characteristics. We'll be looking at prison leavers, we'll be looking at LGBT, um, we'll be looking at sex workers and things. So I think it's it's very difficult to capture everything within this, but we definitely will be as going forward as part of the action plan. Um, I'm very conscious around the link with mental health and substance use. And I know um, there's an awful lot of work going on within the city around the mental health um, trauma informed. And at this point, I'm going to see if Victoria wants to come in because obviously we want to work very closely together. And it's how we basically dovetail the work that's going on around mental health and make sure that that's um, aligned with the work that we're doing around the substance use, um, alcohol and other drugs. Um, Victoria, I don't know whether you want to come in at this point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, my connection's really poor, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, I wonder whether we, so there's a huge amount of work. So in terms of the new community mental health programme that we're putting across Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire, a big overarching piece of that is for all of that to be trauma informed, just as an example. So there's funding that's going with that to practically train up our workforce and, and, and all that goes with it. So I wonder whether we could on a practical level, maybe incorporate some of that wider work within this strategy so that people, so this strategy has a context of, of that wider programme. And maybe if we make those links more explicit, um, that would give the reassurance that I think you're, um, that you're after. Um, I think in terms of the lived experience too, um, because of the, the large and fast paced nature of this mental health programme, uh, we are engaging with very, very large numbers of people, uh, you know, particularly from protected characteristics. So if if it would be helpful while you're developing that board in the short term to link into this uh, wider lived experience, a whole range of different reference groups from 
people from minority communities to people from LGBTQ+, whichever, if, there's, if, if we can offer practical help, because those groups are absolutely talking about alcohol and, and other drugs in, in the feedback they give us, um, we'd be really, really keen to kind of offer that support. Um, but Councillor Cook, you also referenced the outcomes. And so as part of this wider work, we're developing a, an overarching mental health and wellbeing outcomes framework. And there's a dashboard underneath that. So I wonder again, whether we can link up so that we're, instead of everyone making lots of different dashboards and outcomes frameworks, we, we ensure that we're really incorporating the um, alcohol and drugs aspects, which, which we will be, but maybe we kind of ensure that we're aligning those pieces of work so that we are being as efficient and effective as possible um, in these various different programmes. Okay, so thank, thank you, thank you so much, Victoria and Lee and Ian and um, Lewis for that response. I, I really appreciate that, and I do feel reassured because I feel just at the minute the slight emphasis of this strategy is a little bit on individual behaviour change rather than structural inequalities and mental health and trauma background. And, and I don't honestly believe that we're going to get all that far in creating alcohol free spaces and making alcohol more expensive if we're not addressing those underlying issues, which I know that you are all aware of, but I just would like to see that just reflected a little more strongly in the strategy if possible. And I will stop there and let my colleagues come in. Sorry for taking so long, Brenda. That's all right. I've got <laughs> Eleanor next, then Paul. I'm not sure if Vicky was waiting on me. You're a hard act to follow, Jill. I'm not sure how much I can usefully ask after that. Um, just a comment, really. The idea that there's going to be a board working on delivery and keeping organisations working together, I think that really heartens me. I think that's absolutely brilliant because you need to keep police and health, physical and mental, and the council all kind of pulling in the same direction um, to ensure that consistency and keep people pulling together. I, I do have one question and I'm sorry, it's not really a high level strategic question. It's a, a kind of fiddly one about something that was interesting in the report. Um, there seems to be a big difference um, between what we're hearing from the pupil voice survey about the relationship between LGBT plus identification and alcohol and drug use, where there's a big gap um, between LGBT plus identified youth and the general population, and adult alcohol use and engagement with the road service. I wondered if there was any idea why that was. Are there particular stresses that teenage LGBT plus youth are undergoing that pushes them to, to use drugs more or, or is it just that there's a correlation between kind of early identification and social class or disposable income or something else that might indicate um, drug or alcohol use in child? I just wondered whether there was any information you can give me about the kind of the, that gap between mm youth and adult? I think the first thing probably to, to say is that by its nature the People Voice survey is, is I suppose based on less people. Um, there are less people who's, who are responding to that survey than obviously the adult population of Bristol. And so the numbers, the numbers underlying that finding are perhaps less robust than they, they would have been for the general population. There's also I think potentially an, an element of a question there about the forthright ability that people have to come forward with and, and kind of define their um, sexuality, perhaps. You know, younger people who are responding to an anonymous survey may well feel more free to make that assertion and, and give that view of themselves than adults who are perhaps seeking treatment um, through their GP. Um, so it may, I, I don't have the answer, is my, is my honest um, answer to that. And it's probably it's probably an easy safe easy thing to say. Oh, it's just generational differences. But I would I would imagine that is part of it. I don't know if um, Victoria Lini have a, have another view. Um, there's also there's all sorts of issues where it could be, and it could be uh, things like access to services. Well, it might be that they're not accessing services, or maybe that the adult population are they are drinking more or they are using more substances, but it's not at that point that they feel that they need to access those services. So there's a multiple different reasons around why 
that might be. And I suppose that might be something we can look at exploring, um, particularly around, I think there's a lot of research gaps in young people's substance use and alcohol use that's been picked up and flagged nationally because um, there's an increase in tre trend around that. So it might be something that we have to think about going forward. And as part of that, we'd then look at protected characteristics and protected groups and see whether there's any particular differences. Thank you. Okay, um, I think I had Paul next and then Asha. Thanks, Chair. And I'll try and be as quick as possible. I'm aware time's running on. Um, Lewis, as regards the the, the heroin uh, use, uh, the change from daily to weekly collection for the medication, for the loan injecting, et cetera, et cetera, do we have any data yet as to as to how that has affected that both hospital admissions and or deaths from overdoses? Not that I've seen. Um, we rely certainly at a national level. Um, we would often rely on kind of national data sets that Public Health England will hold. They are often one or two years kind of in arrears, if that's the right term. So, you know, we're only just getting through data in 2019. So I think it will realistically be too early. There is a case to be said that obviously the CCG will hold data on their admissions clearly, but that's not data which is complete and not data which is publishable because of the, the, the issue with kind of it being accurate enough to, to warrant that public look at it. So I, I just, I simply don't have an answer to that, I don't think. And, and the data, you know, that I've referred to, and I think you've made a point of there is, that's very much based on one-to-one -one interviews that were held by people from the university with people in our drug and alcohol system and getting their feedback. And as useful and as rich as that is, that's not obviously a national data set that we can infer too much from. But I think it's a useful finding at this stage. But I, no, I don't think we would, we would see any impact for yet. Let's put it that way. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, uh, uh, going on to my second point is just quickly regarding the safe consumption rooms. And, and I know this is something that Ash has done a lot of work on as well. Um, I'd be interested in, in hearing what sort of progress is being made, um, you know, within the legal uh, boundaries on that. And I wondered if we'd considered anything like in, in, in America, the, the, the designated driver um, wristbands where, where somebody from a, a group in a pub gets a wristband at the start of the evening and then gets free individual um, soft drinks to, you know, uh, encourage, um, as you say, about the, the soft drinks. I'm on licensing as well with Brenda and Eleanor, so maybe that's something, again, that we can talk about at some point on there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think the, the specificity of this sort of actions is very much the step that we're coming on to. The idea of sort of having alcohol-free drinks on tap as one of those nudge-type interventions came off the back of the health and wellbeing board discussion that was had at the start of this process by colleagues from university. The example you're giving there is another similar type of example, um, whereby having a visual kind of identification shows the general support within the venue of, you know, not drinking, frankly. Um, the second, the first point you made, Sorry, I would have forgotten what it was. What's the other part of the question? Sorry. Oh, it's just oh, about consumption. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, my last understanding as to where we're at is that obviously, unfortunately, it's still illegal. Um, there are cities who are trying to push that boundary. So Glasgow, for example, who are making efforts to vocalize their desire to have them and for to be in legislation. I guess what the strategy is trying to do by having it highlighted within it is to demonstrate our intent to be on the forefront of that and to hopefully take the strategic view that that is something which we think there is growing evidence for and therefore that we want to be a part of the conversation of. It's clearly not a commitment to this stage to say, let's go and build one. Um, but it's more of a, yeah. And Asha may have a comment on that in terms of the, kind of the, the aspirations more broadly. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where we're at really. And there's not, the hope I suppose is through the five years of the strategy life cycle, progress will be made in some, in some regard. Okay, and thank you. And, uh, and ever so quickly then, finally, um, with regards to uh, uh, living lived experiences, I'd love to be involved um, with anything going forward. I am, and although I appreciate this is a public meeting, so I will be a, a, a tad discreet for my own protection. I have been a mental health service user, I have been homeless, and I've also lost friends to both to both alcohol and injectable drugs. Um, and I'd love to, to be involved um, going forward, if there's a, any way possible, obviously, um, pending any election results in May anyway. Thank you. Yeah. And I thought it's just worth reinforcing that, even though it's probably true to say that we haven't been able to in, in, you know, involve directly one to one 
hundreds of service users. We have, of course, been working closely with organizations that work with those service users in those communities. Hawkspring, for example, all of our providers, and they are, you know, they are a go-between go to getting those voices. So it's, it's, I, I don't want to put across the opinion that this is something we've written in the closed room, and we have tried to engage with all of the, you know, the, the service users as much as possible. Yeah, I'm a trustee at Hawkspring, and I'm aware of the wonderful work that they do. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. And I've got Asher and then Vicky. Yeah, what I really wanted to add is I, I kind of noted some of the points that were made, particularly by Jill and Victoria. And I think we, that I, I'm sure there's more than enough scope to kind of strengthen, you know, the, you know, the, the concern that you raised around, um, yeah, being a bit more clarity and also making that link between um, the work that we're doing and obviously the work that um, around mental health. So. I'm sure we can juggle the deck chairs a little bit <laughs> and get it perfect. We also need to make sure that it's now report 21 to 25, not 20 to 24. Outdated. Yeah, I mean, I, I just spot that. <laughs> there was, there was, yeah, there was a there was a conscious reason for including that at, at the present, isn't it? I sort of felt like the development of this and the fact that alongside it we've been trying to think about actions and things meant this was a strategy which we've been working on for this entire time but yes i'm conscious that the, the final thing will obviously reflect what, what you're actually in okay okay thank you vicky hi there um yeah in a way some some of them these points might be a little bit similar to, to, to what uh, Councillor Kirk has said and, and Councillor Craig. Um, it was really to, to sort of say that, yes, I, I felt it was, it was a really interesting to read through the, the strategy. Um, I think the, the point around mental health being a stronger aspect of it would be really good to see. Um, and I, I sort of really just wanted to say that I can sort of back that up with some um, a co-production project we've just completed actually in North Somerset so it's sort of obviously not relevant to this area but it was with service users um, of alcohol and drug services and that was one of our recommendation is to make sure that there's a much stronger availability of community mental health support at the same time as recovery so so not after recovery um, so that that was very clear to us and uh, we're quite happy to circulate that great thank you okay. thank you very much just one comment from me um, about acronyms in the report and on one of the well, it's under section four consultation it says internal ECC people DMT EDM and CMB now to me EDM would mean early day motion but I don't think you're actually doing that <laughs> um, no sorry could you lose um, some of the acronyms <laughs> yeah so obviously BCC Pacific Council and um, essentially what I'm trying to what I'm trying to describe there is our internal um, approval processes before this document goes anywhere. DMT is our, um, I don't know what it stands for, um, director, <laughs> director of management team, I think, isn't it, Lini? Um, well, that's yes, that's right. Yeah. So that is the kind of departmental um, group, which is chaired by our director of public health. This is a public health produced piece of work. And so our director of public health would, would chair that group and give it oversight. It would then pass to our EDM, which is our executive director, meeting where the three executive directors of the council come together within their within the people group and talk about it um, and then cmb is a uh, cabinet member briefing which is where it then goes on to the cabinet member for that theme of work which in this case was asha that's great um, so yeah apologies that that has uh, slipped through without clarification okay well I'll, I'll rest my I'll rest my case on acronyms. But Jill, one last quick one. Thank you. I think it relates slightly to abbreviations and terminology. I notice in the report it says adapt to new to the new normal, and I think it that could do with a little bit more clarity and and something specific because although we might know what we mean by new normal, it it, it could mean anything. So if it does relate to the impact of COVID pandemic or whatever, could that be a little more specific? Just just a suggestion yeah, thank course. you i mean just a, just a bit of history the five priorities that were originally there were as of sort of a 2020 we recognized that this process that covid pandemic would have implications for drugs and alcohol therefore this sixth sort of priority area came to the fore in reality that could easily be kind of returned to you know 
be reactive to the current present the current situation because clearly in three or four years that will be different so it's it is yeah, more sure. adaptability so yeah, oh, quite, it could be that yeah. yeah yeah thank you okay well thank you very much for coming and i'm sorry these sort of timings got a bit mixed up um it tends to happen on things like this one particularly when we discovered we had two similar meetings running sort of side by side which mm. uh, did throw things a bit out but um we really did appreciate uh reading all of this and it's it's great so that brings us to the end of the meeting um just wanted to know um vicky did is there anything from health watch any any comments or feedback or anything you'd like us to think about raising in future meetings? Um, certainly there has been a huge amount um, that we've been hearing for the last six months really around um, dental provision oh, and yes. the lack of access to an NHS dentist is in Bristol has become a crisis. Um, so that would be certainly one thing. But um, off the top of my head, I've probably got quite a few others I could suggest um, if you'd like me to sort of... Would you, would you like to go away and have a think about yep. it and Thank hold you. it to us? Because be it would be really helpful. Yeah. And I, I mean, the dentist thing is definitely an issue. I managed to get to my dentist recently and had to pay £15 for PPE. Oh, my I know. <laughs> if it wasn't that I was terrified of not being able to get to a dentist if I abandoned them, yeah. Not good. That was Bupa. So, yeah, a bit expensive. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming. We don't actually have a date for our, for our next meeting because we've got something inconvenient called local elections in the way. So as to who might be on this panel in future, we don't know at the moment. But we do have uh, a JHOSC meeting, a joint health overview and scrutiny meeting on the 15th of March at 11.30. Uh, that's with South Gloucestershire and North Somerset. So um, we might see some of you there. And anyway, thank you to everybody who's contributed today, both presenting and also asking questions. I think it's been a really useful meeting. And thank you very much and see you all again soon. Bye. Thank you, Brenda.